Good day, brothers and sisters. It's Sunday once again. And we are very thankful to God that we have been given another day to be able to praise and worship Him. Now, praise and worship is the sole right of God and God alone. This is something that cannot be given to any human being, to any created being, and not to any of God's creation. To do so, as the book of Romans states, would be unrighteousness. It would be idolatry. And you and I know that for idolatry, when we exchange the glory of God for another, the wrath of God will come upon us. And sadly, in the world today, we have polished so many idols and so many gods. Yes, there are those who claim to know Jesus Christ, and yet in truth, there are rivals in their worship of God because there are certain things that they prioritize over and above God. Now, if there is a lesson we can learn, it is that we are to worship God and Him alone. This was something that John the Beloved learned when an angel appeared before him. He saw the glory of this angel. And by the way, the angel's glory is merely a reflected glory of God. And yet it was so glorious that John could not contain himself. He began to worship the angel. But he was rebuked by the angel. And I'd like to read that before you. It says here in verse 8, And I, John, am, am he that heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel that showed me these things. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am a fellow servant with thee and with thy brethren, the prophets, and with them that keep the words of this book worship God. And worship God, I believe, is a contrast emphasis in Greek. And what it means simply is this, worship God and God alone. Not me, not an angel, not any human being, not anybody, not any object, not money, not fame. Only God. Only God. And that is what righteousness is all about. And that is the reason why we worship.
Walang katulad Inalay mo Buong buhay mo Para sa kaligtasan ko Wala nang ibang Hihigit pa sa'yo Ikaw lang ang Diyos Ikaw lang ang Diyos Sang mahihim Purihin ka Sang mahihim ka Yesu Kristo Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph, and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sabana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. The title of today's sermon is Divorce and Remarriage, Is It Scriptural? We'll take our text from Matthew 19, verses 1 to 12. Let us now read God's Word. When Jesus had finished these words, he departed from Galilee and came into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? He answered and said, Have you not read 
that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, If the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, Not all men can accept this statement, but only to those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. Let's bow our heads in prayer at this time. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you, Lord, for this blessed time you've given us that we might once again study your holy word. We pray, O God, that we might approach your word with reverence, and not only with reverence, but with a desire for obedience. Lord, we ask your grace and mercies to be upon us. I ask for the unction of the Holy Spirit, that I might communicate your word in such a manner that it will bring conviction and persuasion in our hearts. Lord, whatever is going to be achieved today, we will give you back the glory, the praises, and the thanks. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen and amen. You know, I think it's quite useful at times to look into certain statistics because somehow it reveals to us the moral as well as spiritual climate of a nation or of a people group. And that is why I'd like to be able to share to you some statistics which I got hold of. And sometime in 1995, in the United States, there were well over one million divorces. For every eight marriages, there was one divorce. Nearly every state had exacted a no-fault divorce law making divorce almost as easy as marriage. It is not surprising, therefore, that the largest caseloads in civil courts during that time relate to family disputes. Now, in more recent statistics, according to the American Psychological Association, approximately 40 to 50% of first marriages end in divorce. Can you imagine that? Almost half of those who get married will probably end up in a divorce. Now, the divorce rate for second marriages is even higher, with approximately 60 to 67% of second marriages ending in divorce. Now, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, the divorce rate in the United States was 3.2 per 1,000 population in 2019, down from 3.6 per 1,000 population in 2018. Now, while that might appear to be a sort of improvement, I'd like to be able to say that a lot of times, the statistics can be a bit deceiving because the truth of the matter is that in the United States, there are more people who prefer to live in rather than get married. So to a certain extent, you need to be able to count that statistic as well 
because I think it will tell you more about the spiritual and moral climate of that nation. Now, anyway, going back to the statistics that I mentioned to you, this means that approximately 827,261 divorces were recorded in 2019, with a total number of divorces since 2000 uh, topping around 8.3 million. Just try to imagine how humongous that amount is. One entertainer in the United States divorced her husband because she felt that her husband was a detriment to her career. Someone said couples are married for better or for worse, but not for long. And that appears to be the mindset of a lot of people, not only in the United States, by the way, but in almost every part of the world. Even here in our country, we do not have divorce laws, but what we have would be annulment laws. Having said that, it doesn't really reflect the fact that most marriages are on the rocks. They are deeply in trouble. And while a couple might desire to live under one shelter or under one roof, it is possible that they are greatly estranged. I recall one wife telling me that she feels that at times she is sleeping with the enemy. And she was referring to her own husband. And of course, there are separations, there are abandonments taking place. And unfortunately, we don't have... Uh, very strong statistics relating to the moral and spiritual climate of our country. Having said that, you and I know that we are in a dire situation as well. Now, the question that needs to be addressed is, what is the scriptural position regarding divorce and remarriage? Now, first up, uh, our first point would be the divorce question in verses 1 to 3. And then we will talk about the biblical position in verses 4 to 9. And what we will discuss in verses 4 to 7 is God's design, wonderfully different and indivisible. And then in verses 8 to 9, we're, we're going to talk about God's concession, a testament of man's failure. Finally, we will talk about man's exclamation. The struggle of staying together in verses 10 to 12. So let's unpack this sermon right now and let's talk about, first of all, the divorce question in verses 1 to 3. In verse 1, it states When Jesus had finished these words, he departed from Galilee and came into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Now, after the sermons that Jesus made in Galilee in chapter 18, we find him going into Judea, where he continued his ministry. Now, Jesus was going back to what we now know of as the religious center, which we know was largely opposed to his ministry. And so that being the case, we are being prepared by Matthew for another challenge to Jesus' messiahship. And that has always been the case whenever the Lord Jesus Christ would go back to the religious center. We would see a lot of opposition, a lot of challenges, a lot of malicious questions and accusations being leveled against the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is something that is somehow preparing us so that we get to see that in this narrative, there would once again be some opposition and challenge to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, having said that, in verse 19, verse 1, we are told that large crowds followed him and he healed them there. And as is customary of Jesus' travels, he always sought to minister to the needs of people. And herein we find the compassion and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever Jesus did, he was doing for the sake of people. 
And that is why we have to see that Jesus is really for man. He is for our own welfare. He desires our own benefit. He wants to be able to bless us. And one of the blessings, of course, that God has given to us is the blessing or the gift of marriage. Now, we go to the point wherein the Lord Jesus Christ is once again confronted by certain Pharisees. And so in verse 3, it reads, Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? So it was in the context of Jesus ministering that Jesus was being asked once again for the purpose of finding fault in him. The question had to do with the legality of divorce. And so it's quite ironic that these people did not have any qualms whatsoever to interrupt the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what was the desire? The desire was to oppose Christ, to challenge Christ. And here, Christ was doing something good. So what we see here is that they were an impediment to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, this question was one other obstacle that they were placing upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why we say these Pharisees were very much accountable to the Lord when they died, when they passed away. And I am so sure they were damned in judgment. They are now tormented in the lake of fire. And what is ironic is that they happen to be religious leaders. Yes, friends, hell will be filled with a lot of religious leaders. And that is the case here, I believe. Now, when it comes to marriage, there were two basic positions regarding marriage and divorce and even remarriage. First up, the followers of Shammai held that a man could not divorce his wife unless he found her guilty of sexual immorality. So herein we find that the followers of Shammai were a lot more conservative compared to their other contemporaries. And that is why they were saying that marriage is a permanent thing and the only thing that could break the marriage vow is when there is, when there is sexual immorality that is discovered. So in the case of uh, the Jews, it could be a case of adultery or it could be a case of fornication during the engagement period. Now, the followers of Hillel were very lax on the other hand. They were allowing divorce for many, including trivial reasons such as an improperly cooked meal, which probably had too much salt or too little salt, a burnt bread, being ugly, talking to other men, putting the hair down in public, speaking ill of one's mother-in-law, and it could even be barrenness. So if you really look at the followers of, Sh of Hillel, rather, we find that they were probably just looking for any reason to divorce their wives if there was some dissatisfaction that they have or when their feelings are no longer present. And probably uh, they have seen another prospect or another woman. And because of that, they wanted to dump their wives. They wanted to divorce their wives so that they could legitimize their own getting married to other women. And this is really very, very sad because, you know, it's like the changing of clothes that we find here in the case of the people of Hillel. There was, in fact, an ancient rabbi who taught, if a man has a bad wife, it is a religious duty to divorce her. Talking about coming up with spiritual and moral excuses to divorce one's wife. But all of this would be limping and lame excuses. I mean, why should you divorce a wife and why should you even consider it 
a religious duty. But then again, this was the kind of thinking that confronted the Jews during the time of Jesus Christ in the first century. Now let's talk about the biblical position in verses 4 to 9. And so first up, let's talk about God's design, wonderfully different and indivisible. So let's uh, have a look at verse 4 all the way to verse 7, but we'll read verse 4 and 5 first. It says, And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, what I'd like to be able to do at this time is to break it down for us. Look at it line by line, word for word, just so we don't miss out on some of the very important nuances of the marriage life. Now, before answering the question, Jesus laid down some uh, very important foundations regarding marriage. First, he cites the creation of male and female species. Now, the word male and female happen to be a focus emphasis in Greek. And I believe what it is truly highlighting is that the man and the woman are different. And so this is something that you and I know instinctively. I mean, you and I know that males and females have, have vast differences in terms of temperament, in terms of physical strength, in terms of uh, emotions, in terms of perspectives, and, and so on and so forth. And we can count a lot of those things and observe them. For example, you and I know that because of the menstrual cycle that women have, they have this tendency to be quite irritable during that menstrual period. Now, of course, that should not be an excuse, but that is one way of understanding the difference. The males, of course, don't have to battle with men menstruation because they don't have that kind of a situation. Now, when it comes to emotions, we find that women are more or less holistic in their view of love. And by that, what I mean is that they cannot seem to separate or compartmentalize their love life. Unlike the men, the men usually are able to compartmentalize their, their lives. So when they are at work, they're not thinking of their love life. They're thinking about meeting the quota. They're thinking about impressing their bosses. In the case of women, they can't really um, remove themselves completely away from their emotions towards their spouses. And that is why even while working, they might even be texting uh, a spouse or a husband and asking, do you still love me? And, and things like this are really pretty normal in the case of women. And then, of course, men are usually, um, I would say, facts-oriented. Women are more person-oriented. And so when there are news coming into the picture, the men normally would think in terms of what and maybe why but the woman would think in terms of who. And so there are these differences, friends. But then having said that, they are different but complementing. They are different but supplementing. They are different but interdepending. They are different but supporting in design to make the marriage successful. God actually designed a team of two. Sadly, marriage has often become a competition of two people. And that's the tragedy here. It is a failure to discern and decipher God's design for us. 
First of all, a recognition of the difference, and secondly, an understanding that these differences are not meant to clash with each other, but these differences are intended by God to mesh with each other so that we complement one another. Where one is weak, somebody can be the strong one. And for the strong one to be able to be the one who will be able to be of assistance to the other one. So again, the sad part here is a failure to understand what it is to enter into marriage. Now then, in this passage, Jesus cites the fact that they were created to enter marriage, and marriage is described here as the two shall become one flesh. Now, this speaks of absolute unity, whereas they were two before, two distinct people. Now, they are only one. They are no longer independent from one another, but completely dependent on each other. They no longer live separate lives, but lives that are glued to one another, as implied in the word cleave, which comes from the Greek word uh, kolao, which refers to a strong bonding together of objects and often was used to represent gluing or cementing. And so, again, we're talking about an indivisible bond, a bond that should not be broken, a bond that, that, that should not be destroyed, a bond that should not be interrupted. We're talking about absolute unity here. Now, here's another note. The word cleave speaks not only of the joining of souls, but it also speaks of physically being together. And at this time, I'd like to address this point to some of our OFWs. And, you know, I know their stories because I happened to visit our church in Hong Kong for, for several times. And one of the things that they complain about is infidelity on the part of their husbands. And I'd like to be able to say this. We are not really intended to be separate from each other. To be sure, we do have needs, and we have needs to provide for our children, to provide a beautiful future. And I understand this is the motivation of a lot of our OFWs. But here's the thing. Sometimes we uh, gain a lot of money, but we sacrifice our marriages on the altar. And this is very sad. I think we just have to learn how to trust God, how to provide for us. Now, of course, in some cases, you know, it cannot be avoided that, that some have to go abroad, but let it be that it will just be only for a few months. I hope and pray we're not talking about years upon years of waiting. Some people wait for 10 years. Some people wait for, for longer than that. And that cannot produce a healthy, successful marriage because there will be temptations along the way. There will be trials along the way. And we need each other to stay together, to support one another, to pray for one another, another to bear one another's burdens. And so, again, uh, this is something that I want uh, you to process, most especially those of you who are OFWs. I pray that you might somehow learn or pray about your situation, that one day God might just put you together, not only spiritually, not only emotionally, not only mentally, but most especially physically as well. Now, as it is unimaginable, um, unimaginable for one part of your body to be separate from each other, it is also unimaginable for a couple to be separate from each other. I mean, can you imagine yourself without an arm or without feet? It is a horrible thought, isn't it? Now, let me share to you a story. 
The following unsigned letter was published by the Grand Rapids Press expressing the pain and heartache of a broken home. I'm, I'm going through divorce, said this letter, and it is no picnic. I have two children that I don't see often enough. I am alone most of the time, and time is all I have. If you are married, live it up, but live it up with your spouse and not someone else's. The heartbreak of losing years of your life and your wife and your children nearly kills you. It is as if you have died. The man concluded his letter by saying, I hope you never have the hurt I have had. Now, as a sidebar, the Lord Jesus mentioned, a man shall leave his father and mother. Now, this speaks of separation from parents to become a family unit by yourselves. This speaks of independence and autonomy. As I always say in many wedding ceremonies, the umbilical cord needs to be cut between the parents and the ones who are getting married. Because if your parents are still present as authorities in your marriage, they will, with good intentions by the way, decide for you and interfere in your decision making. This will create frictions between your spouse and your parents and it will be a case of the in-laws becoming outlaws. Now we have to make a decision as parents that if our children are married, we should take the back seat and serve as maybe advisors, but never to advise when our counsel is not being asked. We must allow our children to make their own mistakes while prayerfully asking God to guide them and strengthen them every step of the way. We have to understand that they are now adults and they need to live their lives. They need to learn the ropes of life. And again, we should always be there in the background, waiting to be of assistance, waiting to help them, counseling them, but never being that authoritative figure that we used to be as parents. Now, of course, when we talk about exceptions, an exception, however, is if the parents come to live with you because they are widowed or they enter into old age and they cannot fend for themselves. Sacrifices will then have to be made by the children. For after all, our parents were there in our growing up days. They supported us, they sheltered us, they fed us, they sent us to school, they supported us, prayed for us. I mean, uh, countless blessings coming from our parents. I think it is only right that we repay them during their golden years, their, their age when, the age when they are weak and cannot fend for themselves. Now let's go to verse 6. It says, So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God had joined together, let no man separate. Anyway, going back to our main point, one flesh speaks of absolute unity. As it is unimaginable for one part of the body to be separate from your body, so it is unimaginable to be separate from one another. Now, because of this absolute unity, which we have to understand God is the one who has brought this uh, about and brought us together, there must be no separation. Remember this verse means that every marriage is made in heaven. And every couple who gets married needs to understand this. God was the one who really was the officiating minister of our own marriages. And when we made vows, we did not just make vows before the sponsors. We made vows before God himself. And a vow, my dear friends, 
is sacred. It is holy. It should not be violated. It must be uh, kept. It must be followed. It must be followed through. Otherwise, we are breaking our vows before God. And you know, heaven is not going to be silent. God is going to, to chastise us if ever there is something that is wrong in us which has brought about the failure in marriage. Now, the phrase, let no man separate, is a negated present imperative in the Greek, which means that we are commanded by God never to seek divorce. It should be farthest from our minds. We should not even think about divorce. And so, friends, this is the force of this particular Greek nuance, and God is really telling us we should not in any way cause any division whatsoever in the marriage. And that's why we should really keep the peace and, and the unity and the harmony. And I always tell the couples, marriage is hard work. It's not just all romance. Romance is something that we expect or have in the first two or three years of the relationship. And after that, Unless you're willing and determined to work on the marriage to make it successful, unless you are intentional in continually nurturing and nourishing this relationship, then nothing is going to come out of it. The fault really lies in the fact that in so many cases, it's not really an abrupt drift away, but a slow drift away from our partner. Remember, even that is true in our relationship with the Lord. The Lord, in the book of Revelation, told the Ephesian church, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. And a lot of us, when it comes to our spouses, we have lost that first love. And how can we regain that? Well, by working on it. By doing the initial deeds that we did to bring about this union, that brought about rather this union. And so again, Jesus states his position. He is not for divorce. And this is exactly the position of God in the book of Malachi chapter 2 verse 16 where God states, I hate divorce. We have to uh, hear the force of that tone and that those words that God speaks in the book of Malachi, I hate divorce. And we have to be able to say that. We have to agree and confess with God that we are in perfect agreement with Him. And we should constantly be telling ourselves, our partners should constantly be telling themselves, I hate divorce. We hate divorce. Let no man separate what God has joined together. I would just like to share to you an illustration of a man who, who really understands the principle of marriage. In his book, Straight Talk to Men and Their Wives, James C. Dobson quotes a heart-touching letter his father wrote to his mother before they were married. It reads in part, I want you to understand and be fully aware of my feelings concerning the marriage covenant which we are about to enter. I have been taught at my mother's knee and in harmony with the Word of God that the marriage vows are inviolable and by entering them, I am binding myself absolutely and for life. The idea of estrangement from you through divorce for any reason at all, although God allows one infidelity, will never at any time be permitted to enter my thinking. I am not naive in this. On the contrary, I am fully aware of the possibility. 
unlikely as it now appears that mutual incompatibility or other unforeseen circumstances could result in extreme and mental suffering. If such becomes the case, I am resolved for my part to accept it as a consequence of the commitment I am now making and to bear it, if necessary, to the end of our lives together. Now, listen to that. Hear the voice of that man. Listen to his heart. It's talking about a determination and intentionality to stick together through thick and thin, through bad times and good times, through sickness or in health, through, through poverty or in riches. You know, it might be helpful for us to understand that ultimately marriage is not about us. When Paul talked extensively about the roles of husband and wife in Ephesians chapter 5, he showed to us the point of marriage. First, in terms of emphasis, Christ is mentioned about 13 times in that passage. The context again, what is being talked about is marriage, and yet Christ is mentioned about 13 times. The husband is mentioned only about nine times. The wife is mentioned also only about nine times as well. Now, this statistic alone tells us that ultimately, marriage is about Christ. And we need to understand the primacy of Christ in marriage. It is His, it is his glory that should be foremost in our minds. So we're not just marrying for romance. We're not just marrying for the sake of satisfying a human emotion. We are marrying because our desire is through our marriage, we might bring glory to the name of Jesus Christ. In this passage, Paul tells us that the marriage relationship is a picture of Christ's unconditional love and care for the church. And therefore, our marriages should reflect exactly that, most especially on the part of the husbands. God has, has made us the head of the family, and that being the case, we are the priest of the family. And because we are the priest of the family, we are responsible for the spiritual and emotional and physical welfare of our spouses. And we have to somehow put it in our minds that if ever it comes to our hearts that we want to divorce, we want to quit on the marriage, we have to ask ourselves the question, what about Christ? What about the glory of Christ? What will this, if I divorce my wife, what will be the testimony for Christ? Have you ever thought about that, dear believers? A lot of times we're just thinking about ourselves, our needs, our satisfaction, our self-centeredness. And we fail to understand that it's about the glory of Christ. As such, as married couples, we are supposed to reflect Christ's unconditional love. The thought alone, that thought alone should make us shun divorce because marriage is about giving glory to Christ. Actually, the whole of our lives is about giving glory to Christ. And that is why Paul was very clear on that. Whether we eat or drink, we do it all for the glory of Christ. Dear couples, are you thinking in those terms? Are you thinking in, in that kind of a mindset? Are you thinking biblically? Are you thinking just like Christ? Are you thinking in terms of what would bring honor and glory to Christ? I'd like you to process that, dear friends, because this is not just about you. This is, more importantly, 
about the Lord Jesus Christ, the preeminence of Christ, the glory of Christ in our lives. Now in verse 7, it says, They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? Now, the Pharisees trying to contest what Jesus Christ had just mentioned cite the law of Moses in Deuteronomy 24, 1 to 4. So, as Jesus was saying about the, uh, as, as Jesus was talking about the fact of the, uh, that, that marriage is indissoluble, now we find it being contested once again by the Pharisees. And again, the question is, why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? But Jesus answers that it is God's concession, which, by the way, is a testament of man's failure. And we find this in verses 8 to 9. And he said to them, Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it has not been this way. Now, the phrase hardness of heart happens to be a focus emphasis and shows us where the real problem lies. The real problem lies where? Our stubbornness, our sinfulness, our selfishness. It is from the heart where all the problem emanates. And that is why, friends, we need to guard our hearts because it is the wellspring of life. This is where it all begins, that division, that separation, that, that movement away from each other begins from here. And that is why we have to be very, very careful. And what Jesus explains here is that the law of Moses was God's permissive will, but Jesus makes it clear that this is not God's desired will. It is not God's perfect will. And by the way, the word beginning is a contrast emphasis telling us that God's original design at the start did not include a backup plan of divorce in case it gets hot in the kitchen. Let me say it again. It was never included. Divorce was never included as a backup plan. And therefore, friends, really, what is the desire of God? That we stick it through thick and thin. Let it be. If ever divorce takes place, that we are not the reason for the divorce. Let me say that once again. If ever divorce takes place, let it be that we are not the reason for the divorce. Because if we happen to be the reason for the divorce, then friends, I tell you, you will never ever be successful in any relationship whatsoever. You will always fail. You will always be miserable. Your relationships will always end in tragedy. In verse 9, Jesus says, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. Now, divorce to Jesus is abhorrent as is felt rather in the tone of this passage. If you divorce your wife and you marry another woman, that is adultery. The only concession for divorce and remarriage is if your wife committed immorality as found in the exception clause, except for immorality. And, and by the way, even if that happens, I believe that we should still allow forgiveness. We should still allow room for, for repentance. As in the case of Hosea, who married a harlot, who married a whore, a woman who became unfaithful to him and probably bore children who were not his own. 
but children who belong to someone else. And yet Hosea still took her in. Hosea still continued on in that marriage relationship. Friends, I believe that this passage also teaches that only the victim is allowed to remarry and not the victimizer. Because that would somehow be um, legalizing sin and adultery. Now, St. Paul, by the way, gives us another reason for a marriage in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 12 to 15. And allow me to just read this. But to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Yet, if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. So here, a second scenario is, if the husband or wife who is an unbeliever leaves or abandons the wife or the husband who happens to be a Christian. The word to watch here is not under bondage. And clearly, that statement alone means that that person who was victimized or, or was abandoned can now remarry. Now, if the unbeliever chooses to remain with the believer, the believer should remain married. That is what Paul is trying to say here. But you might say, that's hard. Well, true. But aren't we taught by the Lord to die to ourselves and prefer God at all times? In spite of all the differences, most especially in the case of spiritual things, we are to still stick it out in the marriage relationship. Now, please do not forget the point of Paul's passage, of this passage, is that it absolutely discourages divorce. It is not meant to encourage divorce. Notice also, it does not talk about believers abandoning each other. The implicit point, the implicit point is this. Believers are not expected to divorce each other. Let me hammer this again. Believers are not expected to divorce each other. Let me say it again. Believers are not expected to divorce each other. Now we go to our third and final point, the man, man's exclamation, the struggle of staying together as found in verses 10 to 12. In verse 10, the disciples said to him, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it is better not to marry. Now, there were some disciples who thought of this position of the Lord as being too conservative, and as shown in the Greek, which highlights the phrase like this. They wanted a more lenient and loose law on divorce. You mean to say, I can't divorce my partner if we are incompatible? Yes, you can't divorce. You mean I can't divorce my partner even if we fight every day? You mean I can't divorce my partner even if he or she is obsessed with his or her career or she no longer has the time for the family? You mean I'll have to stick it out with my partner even if I no longer have feelings for my partner? The answer is yes. You don't enter into marriage with a backup plan to move out of that relationship if it doesn't work out for you. Friends, no. Once you're married, you should stay married. Let it be 
that you will never ever be the reason for any separation or estrangement or abandonment. Now, looking at this seemingly difficult prospect in marriage where you cannot bail out when you become uncomfortable in your marriage situation, they then, the disciples then conclude, it is better not to marry. And how did Jesus answer? On well, verse 11, he says, But he said to them, Not all men can accept this, but only to those to whom it has been given. The point of this passage is that celibacy, or blessed singleness, should not be entered into because of the impossibility of moving out of a marriage relationship when it becomes uncomfortable. So celibacy should not be a reason simply because marriage is difficult. This is not the right reason in entering the celibate, the celibate life. Now, the only reason that Jesus seems to accept is celibacy that is a calling for the sake of God's kingdom, as cited by the phrase given, which is a perfect tense, which tells us that the only that only those called to be celibates have the perseverance to continue on in the single life. For those who are called to such a life, then they must accept such a calling. Finally, in verse 12, it says, For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. And there are also eunuchs also who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. There are many celibates and there are many reasons why men enter into a celibate life. Now, Jesus here is simply citing the reasons for celibacy and not necessarily validating them. As I mentioned to you, the only one that Christ would validate is if it is your gift to be a celibate. Otherwise, you should get married because it is better to marry than to burn, as Paul would say. So as a conclusion, the bottom line is this. God is for permanence in marriage, and whatever concession he makes is just exactly that. Remember, God says, I hate divorce. Let that be what should be foremost in our minds as well as in our hearts. Let us now pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you for today. And thank you, Lord, for teaching us about marriage. And let it be that those of us who are married or intend to get married, may it be that we follow your spirit, follow your heartbeat, Follow your design for marriage that we might bring glory to the name of Christ and not shame. Lord, we thank you also that we could partner with you in sharing our resources for the work of the kingdom. May you bless us, Lord, not because we're greedy and covetous, but because we desire to bring honor and glory to your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So, friends, again, at this time, we're very thankful to the Lord that um, we're coming out on media and social media as well. So we're on Light TV every Saturday at 6.30 p.m. And then we're also in Mega Manila in DZAS uh, Sundays at 9.30 p.m. And incidentally, we are broadcasting through FEBC radio stations all over the country. And also, we'd like you to know that we have other platforms like Facebook and YouTube, and we'd like you to subscribe to them and like and share it, please, so that more and more people can um, hear the word of the Lord. May God bless you all. We'll see you again next weekend. Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members 
through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph, and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Good news, brothers and sisters! A radio program will now be heard nationwide through FEBC radio stations. As an added bonus, all Living Word original songs will likewise be aired as well. So, if you would like to listen to our radio program, we're coming out in the following stations. 702 DZAS AM Broadcasting from Pasig every Sunday, 11 a.m. to 11.30 in the morning. We're also coming out from 104.3 DWAY FM from Legaspi. This is also every Sunday from 10 to 10.30 in the morning. And for those of you in Tacloban, we're coming out from 97.5 DYFE FM every Monday from 11.30 in the morning to 12 p.m. For those of you in Zamboanga, we are coming out from our station in 1116 DXAS AM every Sunday from 11.30 to 12 p.m. Also, for those of you in Davao, we're coming out from 1197 DXFE AM every Sunday from 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 2.30 p.m. For those of you in Coronadal, we're also coming out from station 1062 DXKI AM every Saturday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And for those of you in Cagayan de Oro, we're coming out from 103.3 DXJL FM every Sunday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And for those of you from Metro Cebu, we're coming out from 98.7 DYFR FM every Saturday and Sunday from 8 to 9 p.m. Please tell your friends about this and tune in to our radio program. Let us pray that God might use this radio program to become a blessing to as many people as possible. God bless you all. Great news, everyone. We already have three weekend services every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sabana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. We'd also like to thank our partners, our members who have been consistently giving to partner with us in the work of the Lord. We'd like to share our giving channels to those who would like to partner with us in the work of the Lord. You can deposit your love offerings to the following banks. Banco de Oro. Account name is LWCCCII. The account number is 001-000060800. We also have a BPI account. Account name is Living Word Christian Ministries, Cebu Incorporated. Account number is 10210234814. Finally, we have RCBC. Account name is LWCCCII. Account number is 1452005286. To give via GCash, just follow these simple steps. From your GCash app, click Bank Transfer. In Bank Transfer, click the BDO icon under Select Partner Banks. Enter the amount, enter the name LWCCCII, and account number 0010006080. And send the receipt to Office 
at livingword.ph Then click Send Money. You may also send your love offerings and donations online through our website. Go to www.livingword.ph and click Give and then a dialog box comes out of it. Kindly click on your giving preferences. Thank you and God bless.